Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to the Real Interaction 411 presentation. Now, every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything in a particular industry. Ashlyn, Ben, David, Nate, and myself have been working for the past four months on a product that will change film production, but we aren't the first ones to do it. In 1964, the film Mary Poppins was one of the first movies to incorporate digital elements into their real world setting. Now this opened up the industry to previously unimaginable possibilities. Now in 1988, the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit fully immersed an actor into a cartoon world. Sorry, I'm Fully immerse the actor into a cartoon world using blue screen technologies and physical placeholders. And lastly, in 2009, the film Avatar put motion capture on the map with its high-tech marker-based tracking system. Now my question is this. If all this stuff has been working for decades, then what's the problem? supplement with uh, the information that the user is receiving from that environment. And ideally, an augmented reality system would provide a natural interaction between the digital assets and themselves. <coughs> and then finally, uh, the reason that we are most interested in it is because it allows the user to retain that vision of the real world, but with the additional digital elements overlaid. So as you can see here, this guy is on uh, the Ray-Bans website, I believe. And he's actually seeing what these glasses would look like while he's wearing them uh, through the website. And this provides much more information and a much better idea of what they're actually going to look like as opposed to just looking at a picture of them or even a 3D model of them. So he gets a much better idea of what the final outcome would be. And so this is the reality virtual continuum. Um, on the end towards me here, we have a completely real environment uh, where everything is physically there. That would be this room or outside. Um, I haven't been outside much, but from what I hear, it's a pretty real environment. Um, and then on the complete other end of the spectrum is a completely virtual environment where everything is simulated, nothing is physically there. What we're interested in lies somewhere in the middle with augmented reality. That is, we're really hoping to achieve uh, to retain that physical environment, but add those digital elements in for them to interact with. And so once uh, we started, once we figured out that we wanted to use augmented reality, we had to figure out how are we going to actually allow the user to interact with these objects. And that's where we started looking into motion capture, or mocap. And essentially this is just the process of tracking and recording the movements of a person or objects. And here we have a quote from Sam Worthington, who we had a picture uh, up earlier of. Star of Avatar, he said, there is a difference between being out in the real world and coming into this great desolate area and having to try to remember what it was like. And essentially what he's talking about is there's a huge difference between when an actor goes out into a setting and acts and when they go into a motion capture stage and has to try and recreate that experience for themselves. And so this is a traditional mocap stage, uh, what it would look like. Uh, you can see it's a pretty bland area, maybe some very simple props to uh, illustrate certain things that would be there. But essentially the actor would wear this you know, funky suit with a bunch of uh, markers on it, 
and cameras around the room would track these markers and uh, record that data. And then what you can do is you can overlay a 3D model and replicate that movement. So how are we going to implement these technologies into our product? Um, what we decided is that the Unity 3D engine would be a perfect place to um, put these digital elements into an environment where they can be interacted with. Um, the biggest benefit of the Unity 3D engine for us is that it comes in with a it comes with a built-in physics engine. What this means is that when you interact with an object in there, um, the object will respond in a way that's very similar to how it would react in its natural environment. Um, it's also easy to program and it's cross-platform, which gave us a lot of freedom in how we were going to develop our product and on what systems we were going to use it on. And then finally, once we had this environment with these digital objects in there, how are we going to handle user input? And the obvious answer for us was the Microsoft Connect. Uh, the biggest benefit of the Microsoft Connect is that the tracking it does is infrared and depth based. That means that it's completely independent from things such as lighting uh, and markers, which is a huge benefit because that means that we can set up our system in almost any environment and nobody has to wear a suit with markers on it. And it gave us a lot of uh, independence there. Uh, secondly, they're cheap. So instead of spending tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop a uh, motion capture stage, uh, we could track the user's movement and record that data by spending a couple hundred dollars. And then finally, the SDK that comes with the Microsoft Connect allows us to easily input that data right into the Unity engine. And by combining the best of both of these worlds, um, it allowed us to um, have our iPad die. <laughs> um, sorry about that. I saw the charger. Charger, okay. Um, you know what would be super cool is if um, right about now we could use our product to not only um, interact with complex digital elements inside of a game engine, but if you could just use a simple gesture to interact with something as simple as PowerPoint slides. Actually, yes, we can. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Introducing the revolutionary augmented reality interaction with virtual objects. The real interaction. <coughs> so for the past four months, we have been developing a augmented reality environment on Unity 3D with physics and uh, physics interaction between 3D character models and 3D objects. And also we have our camera feeding into our background. So you have this scene that has our like real world background plus our virtual object and both and like the 3D character we have and the virtual object can interact to each other in, uh, in real physics environment. Also, we made a virtualized small cap system using, using the Kinect. <coughs> it's Kinect, Microsoft Kinect for Windows SDK that has all, all the, the, all the function ready in the software and has all the full control to the camera and can render skeleton data and can also get the camera information and the infrared camera information. To recap, we made an augmented reality environment in <coughs> Unity 3D. We made a markerless motion mocap system that's cheap, that can track everything without a marker, but we combine them together. We call it the real interaction framework. The real interaction framework, we somehow get the two system talk to each other and via a wireless, wireless network protocol developed by UC Berkeley called Open Sound Control. Also, the reason why we made this a framework instead of like a whole software package is because we want to we want them to not only work for movie production, we want to work for everything. So some so for the next demo, we replace this part to an iPhone app that may be developed by some, somebody else, but also under open sound control protocol. We got, uh, and we still use this, the, the receiver part. We made this uh, iPhone gyroscope tracking with Unity 3D. So in this tracking stage, I have my iPhone 5 that using that app, <laughs> using that app open some control, transferring information to the Unity, 
you need a sign to be made and the real interaction framework. As you can see, after I put the iPhone into my pocket, the camera here will be tracked will be tracked real time by my direction or, or orientation. It's like I can turn around and the Unity the camera in Unity will turn around based on my direction. cannot just do the swiping thing if, if the camera cannot see me because it, it, although it's a high tech gadget but it's, it cannot do anything that it cannot see so we made four Kinect to accomplish our goal so the four Kinect gonna cover all four directions we have and we have like and we have one Kinect to connect each, each computer so we don't have like really really intense computing power to be considered and so and all those four server are gonna transfer their data, their the connect data they capture wirelessly by the real interaction framework to our receiver uh, <coughs> client, like the the little laptop here. And that laptop is gonna connect to a projector, just like just like this setup. And the projector is gonna project all the, the augmented reality result we got from Unix 3D to a to uh, to the projection screen. An actor can just see the projection screen to be an augmented reality mirror, just like you think you doing like you seeing the mirror in your home. <coughs> okay, so now let's let's transfer to Nate to talk about our testing. All right, so for our testing purposes, so uh, for our testing, we actually had three separate tests that we decided to do. The first one being a simple test, the second one being a moderate test, and the third one being a complex test. So what these tests were designed to do was to see the limit of our connects and how well they were actually able to track. So for our simple test, this is Ben here uh, during his test. Um, basically for our simple test, you started out with your standard T-pose, uh, which is what most modelers and animators actually start out in, in a 3D package. Um, this is basically, uh, we chose this one because it's, it's very easy for the connect to actually see all of the joints at any given so it has the most probability of tracking all of the tracking data throughout the whole process. For our moderate, um, we actually had a series of stretches that we had people do. Um, these were designed to be fairly simple, but um, they also allowed for the connects to actually lose tracking data because of the crisscrossing joints. For a complex movement, we actually had the users simulate a real world environment or so when you're actually filming on set. We basically told them to come up with as complex a movement as possible and improvise. So basically we decided to have our complex movement actually have them try and break our system as best as possible. So to test, to see how well we did and see if what we did actually worked, we set up a spreadsheet that tracks each jo joint. So there are 19 joints that we decided to track. What it would do is, um, one of the cool things we can do with our system is since we developed it, we can pull out parts of it and replace it with other parts. So when we were doing our testing, we simply just pulled out the part where it would output to Unity and we put in a part that was collecting our data. Um, so we had our spreadsheet, 19 different columns, each one was a joint, and then what it would do is it would test whether or not the joint was tracked by any connect, not just one connect, not just two, but any of the four connects that were hooked up. Um, simultaneously, we could also figure out uh, if one Connect maybe lost the tracking data, or if two connects maybe lost the tracking data, or three, you know. So we could really do a lot with the data. Um, so, but the joints we tracked, we'll go ahead and talk about those next. Oh, anyway, here are the joints that we decided to track. Um, and probably the ones that were tracked the most often, we have the most ones in those columns. Uh, were the head and the spine because it really doesn't matter the orientation, which direction you're facing, it's always going to pick up those middle joints. Um, the ones that we actually lost the most data on probably were the hands and the feet because the, your extremities are kind of flailing around and uh, 
it tend to lose data. So whereas we might get, you know, maybe a 50% tracking data with one connect on the spine or the head, we probably average about 22%. That's with one connect. Um, now, one of the cool things that we could do, uh, so one of the cool things that we could do is statistical analysis based on the, this tracking data. Um, so we did a bunch of ANOVAs, analysis of variance tests. Uh, we actually did 19 of them, uh, one for each joint. And what that would do is it compare having one connect versus two, three, or four uh, to the percentage of time that, that joint is actually tracked. Uh, so we had a bunch of these tables. Um, and this is just an overall of the data. You know, was there a high percentage of every joint tracked? Um, and then what we did is we have the number of cameras over here, um, and it's comparing individually you know, one camera versus two, or one versus three. Uh, and as you can see over the significance column, what we're looking for is we're looking for a significance of 0.05, okay? So if it's less than 0.05, then there is a significant difference. So as you can see, from camera one camera to two connect cameras, there was a pretty high significance. And we actually figured out that there really wasn't much of a difference by having, by having one or two, you know, by having the front camera and the side camera. There actually wasn't much of a difference, which we were kind of surprised by, because we thought that having, you know, front and side, that kind of covers all of your bases, right? <laughs> Apparently not, because as soon as we added in the third camera, the, uh, the percentage of time that the joints were tracked skyrocketed up to about 80%. Uh, here's just a quick chart of what our data actually showed. So each of these blue dots is a test subject. Um, myself, Nate, David, uh, Ben, and Eric from Frame by Frame were all of the test subjects. Um, so we're just kind of testing to see if this all works. And as you can see with one camera down here, the testing data was usually in the high 40%. This is overall. This is overall testing data, not individual joints. Um, and it was you know, high 40s, low 50s. Uh, two camera kind of bumps up, you know, more, you know, 50s, low 50s. But then as you can see in the third camera, it jumps way up to the 80s. Um, so that was something that we noticed across all the different test subjects that we had. Uh, my data was a little weird because I was really tall and we were in a small room. Um, but uh, just overall, we saw that there was a huge jump between two and three cameras. And then there was another significant jump between three and four, but it wasn't nearly as big as the one between one and two. So that brings us to the future of this product. What can we do with this now that we have it? I mean, obviously, it's got uses in film production. That's kind of our whole project was, you know, can we help the film production do something different? Um, but really, there are a ton of different things we can do. We were originally making the system. David actually modeled a 3D environment, and uh, it would track you in the 3D environment. Now, granted, it wasn't you actually. It was a skeleton rig of you. But the, the possibility for virtual reality is there. And it's definitely something to be easily in implemented. Um, at the same time, we've been working with uh, goggles, sort of virtual reality goggles things that we're trying to test out. Um, and that actually is working very well. So there's a ton of potential in games uh, for this product. And then, of course, dynamic business presentations. As you can see by our super awesome swiping, uh, you can take a boring business presentation and you can make it so much cooler by using our technology. Uh, so now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to David and Nate and Ashlyn, who are gonna do a live demo for you right here in this room. <laughs> actually in, 
in just a few clicks, we can actually turn this from an augmented reality to a straight virtual reality environment. When you do your swipes to go to the, you know, the next page and stuff, are the ties part of making that work or not? <laughs> Is your system kind of seeing the hand break the tie line to figure out that you're doing a hand swipe? That's I don't think like the Kinect is programmed to work with a person with three hands. No, no. But yeah. when you, well, when you yes. take your hand across, well, it breaks the, the tie. The ties have nothing to do with it. You can do it with any clothing you need. Okay, so you could have <laughs> flag shirts. And we were doing this. Our our present, our, okay. We were practicing a presentation. Having the ties is nothing. The ties are just for cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
all of WorkNet. Then we looked up like uh, the other software made by University of Southern California called FAASP. That thing can uh, can like just work out all uh, any net data into the internet, but it uses a protocol that's pretty old. That's original design for track trackers, but it's pretty old, and the receiver is uh, like it's out of date, and we couldn't get it work with like the unit tricking client. And then we found out the uh, the other protocol that can actually transfer data just like the old protocol, but but like the, the FAASP doesn't support that protocol. So we made our own system based on their system that use that use both the technology they have plus a new protocol. Therefore we made this whole thing work for us. So essentially yes, a lot of programs. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> Special thanks, we actually <laughs> got that slide. Uh, special thanks goes to Professor Burton in our 411 class, uh, Patrick, Dr. Patrick Connolly, who was our faculty advisor. Uh, we're working with an external company based in California called The Third Floor. Um, they were really helpful in answering a lot of the questions that we had about the industry. Um, they work with film production and pre visualization and stuff like that. Uh, and we'd like to send out a special thanks to uh, Carlos Morales. Uh, he, like, like it said on the slide, he's our sugar daddy. He's the one that uh, purchased the connects for us through the university. Uh, so just a special thanks to that. So this is a Bonferroni. Yeah, this is a Bonferroni. So explain this to me. Okay, well, I know I kind of breezed through it really fast. Um, so, so basically over here we have, uh, so, okay, what a Bonferroni does is it takes all the different elements and it compares it to each other as like a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, rather than um, your typical analysis of variance, which just takes you know all of your camera data and compares it. So we have this is one connect sensor versus two connect sensors, and then all the way over here we have the significance level. This is probably the most important part of this chart uh, because, like I said, if there's a high significance level, that means we reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between adding connects. Yes. Uh, so since we we don't reject it here because yeah. there really wasn't much of a difference. So it's, it's not. Yeah, between one and two. Okay, because you said that that was significant. And now you're confused. Oh, so I, I would it's say like between one and three and one and four is significant. Okay. So as you add um, more than two connects, it okay. gets more and more significant. So then number two and number three are side cameras, and number four is the back camera? Um, it went one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. I think what you were saying was that it was important, but it was not significant. Right. Right. Did you, did you always do your test? When you were adding, it was always 90 degrees off? <coughs> Uh, yes. Did you ever try 320 degrees off? There's a possibility that if you add more and more connects, it can get more and more accurate. There's always that possibility. I'm wondering if 3 in the triangular formation would be as accurate as 4 in the 90 degrees. We didn't try that um, because our system was specifically designed with 4 connects in mind. Um, but that's definitely something that would be worth looking at, I'm sure. Um, probably you'd need your front connect to be in front of the actor, but I think the orientation of the other ones could vary. To add it on that, I think like the, the four square setup is actually easier for us to calibrate for our final product. And the triangle one, we, we have to let the user to space all four edges of the triangle and calibrate it based on the direction they have. And, and 
but for the poor ones, you can't just like them them in a T shape twice, and all four connect gonna gonna calibrate all together. Yeah. 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 So the typical distribution one is something a little bit like this. Uh, for each joint, usually with one connect, obviously depending on the location, like I mentioned in the uh, presentation, your spine joint, the one right in the middle of your body and your head, those had a little bit higher percentage of time tracked. <coughs> but I'll just use the hands as an example. Tracking your hands with one connect, we usually got around 25%. Uh, with two, it usually bounced up to, I want to say about 40. So really, not that big, but then as soon as we added three, it jumped up to about 70%. Um, now for the more centralized joints, the distribution was different. So it might have started at 40 with one connect, go up to probably 65, maybe a little bit less, about 60 for two connects, it would jump up to about 85 for three, and then it would be 95 or above. We had a couple times in a couple of the takes that we actually did have to get 100% tracking data, which is so awesome because that is like what we were going for. <laughs> that was the point of this project. So um, there's always a possibility, like I said, with more connects, who knows? Maybe we can get 100% on every single joint, including your hands and your feet. You know? And then, I mean, if people don't want to do that, there's always a possibility of adding in something like gloves or something. But that's not what we want. We want trackerless marking. Or, yeah, mar yeah markerless tracking. have been testing around with stuff like that, putting connects, uh, well not connects, but motion capture devices up high to see if they get it. They usually have to wear gloves or something. Yeah, so ours is cool. Uh, the guy in the yellow shirt. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or not. Are you guys using an Xbox Connect or a Windows Connect? We're currently using Xbox Connects. We wanted to use the Microsoft Connect as we were advised, but due to Purdue being a little weird on their transportation of those got lost somewhere. So we waited about a month for them and they never showed up, so we decided to go locally and just buy Xbox Connect. Okay. So my, my second point is kind of important. Um, uh, previously, I think uh, like a month ago, uh, the Microsoft representative came and then they kind of claimed that with Windows Connect, you can have three of them and you can actually have a 360 degree view. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you, like, that kind of goes in question with like, the three, three of them. strongly advise the Windows Connect because they just, I mean, they're better at tracking information. But they cost twice as much. They count, they have to cost twice as much. Um, <laughs> Carlos is money. <laughs> right. Yeah, we can, uh, we can ask our sugar daddy. But it's just um, locally, locally we had to go to a store locally to purchase the Connect because it was taking too long to get the ones that we ordered. And I would like to point out we still haven't gotten the ones that we ordered. So that's a thing. Um, and so we had to go locally and buy it and they don't sell
Yeah, but there's a poss. I mean, unless you're like way well over seven feet, there's a possibility of setting it up to track any height really. Okay. Yeah, there's no optimal height unless. I mean, obviously, like I said, not over seven foot probably. Is, is there a distance you want to stay uh, with it, or can you go like thirty feet back? Like if you had huge stage where you have like this massive battle scene, uh, would it pick up everything? Nothing on him, so that so the director can just shoot the scene without without like editing it afterwards. Mm -hmm. But however, if we want to uh, to replace the traditional mocap system, we can just give them a like the virtual reality goggles we talked about on their hand on their head. Sorry, um, they and all those, <coughs> all those like the camera gonna track based on the goggles moving by a, a gyroscope, and the actor gonna see what what the from the view, point of view of that virtual character. So for that case, you basically see uh, like the virtual world, like just like the real world. There's a lot of uses for this technology. So uh, you can either use it as reference or you can actually, the actor could immerse themselves in the environment and more realistically uh, perform. And so it would be less of a cost for shooting and reshooting. <coughs> We started this four months ago. Um, this was not what we had in mind at all. Initially, uh, we wanted to replace the use of physical placeholders because in film production, as you saw with the uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, typically digital elements are tennis balls on a stick or something, and the actor has to somehow interact with that. We wanted to take that out because that, I mean, that technology has been used for decades. And I mean, yeah, it's proven and it works, but at what point is it out of date? That was initially, and so we decided that what if we take out physical placeholders and replace them with digital ones so they have a better idea of what's going on. So you know in like your Iron Man movies when he's doing this and stuff and stuff's moving around, you know, he had to do that, you know, either with, you know, physical placeholders or something like those tennis balls on a stick, or he just had to imagine it. And the problem that comes along with that is uh, if the actor's just trying to imagine what they're doing and there's something off, you know, if his hands aren't perfectly straight on, if they're like this or you know, he's tilting wrong, then they potentially have to go back and refilm it. And refilming costs uh, really, I mean, they cost a lot of money to refilm scenes. Um, so this was 
initially just meant to simplify the process by taking out the use of physical placeholders and just putting in these digital ones that we're talking about. Um, it's since evolved into what you see now. Uh, so there's a lot more uses for it. And we could actually put in the detailed um, you know, pictures or elements that are going to be a 